Oh, hi, hello, and welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your Medusa-obsessed host, Liv. We are truly in the golden age of mythological retellings. There are constant, constant releases of new novels based on Greek myths, and frankly, it's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting for me, a person who just wants people to know more about myth, and but also, you know, hey, if they find my podcast in the process, all the better. Of course, it's also a bit tricky for me, a person who speaks with authors about their novels and is asked by all of you amazing listeners whether I have read all of the varied novels. It's become one of those things where I actually have to turn down most because as much as I think some of you might enjoy it, this podcast just isn't dedicated to speaking to fiction writers. I like to keep it primarily on the ancient sources and academics and their fascinating fields of expertise. And from a personal standpoint, I just can't have myth be every moment of every day of my life, so I don't have time to read most of these books. I have to go elsewhere. So as much as I would love to talk to every single person who's written a mythological retelling, let alone read them, it just cannot be done. <laughs> there are, however, exceptions. Books where either because of the author or the way they have gone about the retelling, whatever it is, it means that I absolutely, without question, have to have them on my show. This is obviously one of those cases. Not only has Natalie Haynes been my favorite author of mythological retellings for quite some time now, but her latest was about Medusa. I, I mean, could I ask for anything more? Absolutely not. It is a novel by Natalie Haynes about Medusa. It is like she wrote it for me. So, of course, I sat down with Natalie Haynes to talk about all things Medusa and her novel Stone Blind. If you haven't read Stone Blind, not to worry. This is also just a fascinating look at Medusa and the characters that surround her, both directly and indirectly. But also, you should probably read Stone Blind. It's come out in North America this just this week, and it's already out in the UK and other areas, so check your local bookstores. With all of that said, and before we jump right into this conversation with Natalie Haynes, I do want to recognize that the publisher of this book in North America is HarperCollins U.S. Employees of HarperCollins U.S. are currently on strike and asking for a fair contract. Not only do I support unions striking for better conditions and pay broadly, but as a person who started out in book publishing at one of the major publishers, and a person who knows just how much those employees get paid <laughs> versus the work involved and the money publishers make, I absolutely and without question stand with the striking union of HarperCollins U.S. Conversations, bringing Medusa back to life with stone blind author Natalie Haynes. Well, thank you for doing this again. It's nice to speak with you again. It's, nice it's been to be like back. two years. <laughs> So Has it fun. really? I was trying to yeah. work out when it was. And I was like, no, I can't. I just can't do it. Yeah. But, yeah <laughs> you were one of the first people I ever had on in like a conversation episode of my show, which is now something I do like all of the time. Um, but amazingly, I started with you and Bettany Hughes. So it was Good like, a, yeah, it was like a very big start <laughs> to that. But it's become a normal thing. <laughs> I love B. B is so great. Yeah, no, it was very fun. It was quite the way to to start out a new system of of record like just even having other people on my show but I think yeah, it started out with sure. a bang and it went well people really love it so but I mean obviously I was happy to speak with you about any book but Medusa is my like love of loves so it doesn't show from your tattoos <laughs> at all no interest there it no. Doesn't look like it. no yeah no I don't I don't have her anywhere uh yeah no I, I mean I'm absolutely fascinated by Medusa and I'm just going to jump straight into talking about Stoneblind because yeah, the, 
the thing that really was so exciting to me is I think that I mean I have a lot of theories about Medusa that run through my head all the time I've done like I don't even know six episodes on her probably because there's always something new to theorize on and I feel like you kind of distilled every theory that I have ever had about her into a novel um in a really perfect way so (laughs) I mean yeah it's like everything I think about or everything I use to like all the facts I use to defend her in any form that I need to because weirdly it happens often is like put into this book um (laughs) so I don't even that's a perfect way to start I think and also slightly rambly um but so let me like before I go off on all of my theories that are in your book how did you want to approach Medusa like how do you think about her in terms of the ancient sources and kind of what did you want your version of her to be well, I decided I would write her novel when I had finished her chapter in Pandora's Jar. So mm-hmm. I'd written a non-fiction chapter about her, thought about her essentially from the outside in quite an analytic way. Um, and then after I finished that chapter, which is about, I don't know, 9,000 something words long, um, a friend of mine asked me what I was working on. And I was like, meow, 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 I'm so angry. Da, da, da. And she was like, wow, I just don't know what's going to happen when you find out about the next 2,000 years of misogyny. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, next one point. Argh. And I thought, if I'm this cross after I've written all those words, I must, I'm, I've got more to say. I'm not done here. So I, I knew I was coming in from a position of feeling really outraged for her. Um, but considering how much I had already written about her, I was surprisingly not ready for the fact that when I came to it, there was so little literary material to go on. I had sort of blithely assumed that when I sat down to start writing Stone Blind, that it would be the same process as writing A Thousand Ships, Mm. which was very much basically, here are all your narratives. Some of them are theatrical, some of them are epic, some of them are, and I would just be choosing my way through what I wanted and what I thought would be most effective in the context and, you know, inventing to fill in the gaps essentially. And I suddenly realized that that would get me roughly, I don't know, four pages. And I was like, oh. Um, and there were, there were loads and loads of visual arts that I could use, of course, and do use extensively um, in the book. But that was just a really different process. I'd written about art in Pandora's Jar, again, from the outside, and I'd stolen the outfit that Themis is wearing in The Thousand Ships comes from a vase painting, for example. So I had done it before, but I didn't realize just how much more of a visual medium I would be working in while writing a novel it's the first time I'd ever done it and and so it felt at the beginning I felt a bit untethered you know I was like how am I gonna how am I gonna weigh this character down in time and place without a sort of a narrative backstory that everyone already trusts even if they don't have it and it was quite it was quite strange. And then I sort of realized, I wrote the first chapter um, where Medusa as a baby is sort of delivered to her sisters to look after. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, maybe this will, yeah. But almost immediately I realized I wanted it to be another polyphonic novel, that it wasn't gonna be just a single, I I had been so confident that this time I would break the habit of a lifetime of novel writing and (laughs) make it one voice. And it was just within minutes, I was like, no, I can't do that because I don't wanna write it all in the first person. And I knew so hard that I wanted the voice of the Gorgonian to be in the first person. Mm. It literally never occurred to me it wouldn't be. And then of course there were so many other narratives that I could throw in some of which work beautifully I felt in the third like Danae's chapters um she's so sort of calm in the face of everything that's kind of lobbed at her telling her in a sort of close third person really worked but if you think I could resist telling a story from the perspective of a chatterbox crow no (laughs) it's like we haven't met I you know that and the snooty olive trees I mean they were just so much fun to do well that leads into more questions but I want to talk about Medusa more especially because I mean Medusa is so fascinating because of what you're saying like there are really so few not I guess well no there are so few sources on her but even Mm. in the few that we have the actual details are like almost non so skinny he gives you a line in the theogony he says there are three gorgons (laughs) 
Um, Steno, Uriali, and Medusa. And the first two are immortal, and the third one is mortal, and that's a wretched fate. That's it, dude. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah it's that's literally an like <laughs> family saga is right here, and you've just put it in four words. What the yeah. hell is wrong with you? <laughs> she it's lay with Poseidon. To to the works of the days. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. She <laughs> oh. lay with Poseidon in a field of soft flowers and suffered a woeful fate. And you're like, that's all yeah. of it. That's the oldest surviving source we have yeah. on Medusa, and that's Turns all over it papyrus, says. Looks again. <laughs> it's like, what's yes. Going on? Like, so, I, I yeah, mean, <laughs> Ovid's a longer version, but of course, Ovid is very much focused on um, the Perseus narrative, which mm-hmm. is less interesting. What I found actually really interesting was when I came to properly think about the. There are two particular vase paintings that that have a big secret starring role in this novel. I feel like one I can of which picture is called, them. <laughs> yeah, one's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and you for sure can um, because it shows. Perseus in the act of decapitating Medusa so his sword is literally curving around her neck it's a mm-hmm. it's a curved blade sword a harpe um and she's asleep you know her she's beautiful she doesn't have snakes mm-hmm. for hair this is Just a the fifth century pos- yeah so she's got this beautiful dark ringlets her eyes are shut so they're just depicted with a tiny curved line for each one and it just felt to me that it was a really ambivalent portrait of, of what's supposed to be presumably a hero overcoming a monster you know we see loads of vase paintings with Heracles Hercules doing exactly that it always looks like he's having a whale of a time you know think of that fantastic pot where he's got brought the pig back for Eurystheus and Eurystheus <laughs> has got the panic on him so he's decided to hide in a pot in which is pot. painted onto the side of a pot for massive mex- metatextuality and Heracles is holding the pig over him and it's sort of it's not quite making a kissy kissy face but it might as well be he's sort of cowering away from it it's like that vase painter is having fun and what's more, Heracles is having fun. But you look at this vase painting of Perseus attacking Medusa, and it looks a lot like what it is, which is a young man decapitating a woman while she sleeps. Mm-hmm. And he even looks like he's like he's sneaking off. He is. Like, he's on, yeah. he's on tiptoe. Exactly. So he absolutely looks sneaky. It's so... Yeah. yeah, and then isn't there like a... I don't know if it's the other side or... There's one where then her head is in the bag and... Yeah, that one's it, in the British Museum. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And it's really similar. Like, like a, her head's yeah. missing and it's, it's in the kibbutz. It's just seconds later. Yeah, it's seconds yeah. later. Yeah. Um, and the head is, as you say, it's stuffed into this bag. So mm-hmm. again, the lack of humanity mm-hmm. that he displays, in my view... I don't think you or I is the first person to notice this. I think those vase paintings look ambivalent because the painter was ambivalent. It mm-hmm. is a difficult story. She's a goddess. She's in the theogony, you know? Okay, she's mortal, so she's not technically a goddess, but she's part of a family of gods and goddesses. And so she makes her way. There are very few mortals in the theogony. Medea is also there, also mentioned as a, a daughter of someone connected to God's granddaughter of the sun, I guess. Mm-hmm. So she is part of this god story um and and she belongs there and i think that probably explains why you know the the wretchedness of her fate as far as hesiod is concerned is that because she's mortal she can be killed and mm-hmm. therefore when perseus embarks on his slightly petulant quest to bring back the head of a gorgon it is medusa who's clearly the the target um but that doesn't suggest to me that there's approval going on mm-hmm. No, I think, yeah, I think her story within Perseus is one of those ones where, like, on the outside, we're expected to think of it as a heroic act. He's a hero. This is Greek mythology. But really, yeah, when you're in the sourcing, like, there's nothing to suggest that there's any good reason why he did this. It's one of the things I tell people all of the time in my daily life, probably to the point of annoyance of just everything we think we know about medusa as her this monstrous thing or or like something that needed to be killed or required death or was like causing trouble like all of that is an invention of the last however long and all based yes. in misogyny and entirely Surprise. yeah right like some new and different for greek mythology <laughs> check but- notes is this the first time that's happened wait <laughs> <laughs> unfurls massive papyrus roll no turns out not oh wait is it but what both of our careers are based off of? Like, yeah, it's it, it, it's one of those things like and I just think even just the idea of why Perseus goes to kill her is so anticlimactic in this really interesting way of just it isn't for any valiant reason. It's literally just an attempt to get him killed off. Like, it's just literally a thing yeah, that yeah. that, you know, that Polydectes thought was going to be impossible. And I it's it's just so fascinating. Um, 
and I so I've I've covered her in many different forms on the show but I I have another um a, a book that's called I think the Medusa Reader and it kind of breaks down all these different sourcing on her from the ancient world oh, up until now but yeah, really I honestly hope story, Ray yeah. Harryhausen's movie, the Clash of the Titans movie from 1980, whenever it is worn, I think, yeah. um, responsible for this. Because in, in that version, then he goes on a noble quest to bring back the head of a Gorgon so he can kill a sea monster and rescue a princess. And it's like yeah. that, we understand how that narrative works. But of course, rescuing Andromeda is a side quest on the way home. In, in every ancient source that mentions it, mm -hmm. it's incidental to the fact that he's gone to get the head of a Gorgon because a petulant man has asked him for one. Yeah. And that's it. You know, there is nothing noble about it at all, actually. And I think that is hiding behind these vase paintings, too, that mm -hmm. what we can see is this isn't, a you know, you, I mean, you can see in the petulance of Eurystheus with that Heracles pot um, that the payback for asking for a petulant thing is is to be punished. And there he is cowering away. And so I feel like that same slightly, you know, judgmental attitude is in play mm -hmm. when we see Perseus. Um, you know, bravely conquering a monster. Well, how is she a monster? Because you don't like what she looks like. Oh, she's killed loads of people. Okay, name four. Oh, wait, what? She oh, there's none? Until she's already been killed. I've never <laughs> been able to find a convincing source that says so. No, I... <laughs> so she's this great monster. And yet, who does she kill? Well, once Perseus is using her head as a weapon of mass destruction, yeah. at one point, an entire island of people at a time, thanks to Ovid. We have that story from the Metamorphoses. But in terms of having agency and making the choice herself, where's this, you know, island covered in statues that we would expect her to live on? It doesn't exist. Yep. Yeah. Everything pre-Ovid is, I mean, that's another one. It's like, it's hilarious hearing all of these words come out of you because I just, I say these things all of the time. Yeah. <laughs> just like, she doesn't hurt anyone until her head is off of her body. Like, yeah. there is no evidence that she has ever harmed anyone in all of the ancient sources pre-Ovid. And yep. yeah, it, it's, it's she's just such an it's so fascinating because I, i'll go back to the what you said about clash of the titans though because not only i think is you're right is that responsible for this idea that like the heroic nature of his quest included that or and the whole point was to save andromeda but i think it also um gives her the monstrosity that we think of now too like she is uh, this I, the idea of her being like echidna like i feel like his version of of her Definitely. yeah it, it looks like what we think of as echidna she's got this like snake bottom half yeah and long that snaky is... tail but exactly. no wings because he'd already done wings earlier in the movie with the harpies mm. i think he couldn't be bothered right. to do them again which yeah, i respect they would be as a choice but yeah. i love the fact that snaky tailed medusa from the harryhausen has cast a long shadow because lego medusa has a snaky tail and it's like so it... many medusas have that now like as if it's canon yeah. it's fascinating yeah, yeah. i mean you know i don't I don't particularly mind it. I love that there was a Ray Harryhausen exhibition in Edinburgh um, in the UK two years ago, I think. Um, and it was quite chastening to discover that the model for Medusa was sort of, you know, like about a, a foot, a foot and a half tall. It's yeah. like, like a sort of, you know, the most monstrous thing she might remind you of is a sort of slightly bad tempered cat or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, OK, it's not quite as scary now, but it, I mean, it is a brilliant depiction. But it's incredibly dehumanizing. Mm -hmm, um, exactly. I think loads of people remember it. I think that is the moment from Clash of the Titans where the skeletal warriors are in Jason and the Argonauts, the thing that gave people the hebes when they were a kid. And so I see the, the you know, it absolutely did its job correctly, but it's cast long shadow. And so mm -hmm. people are very quick to think of her as a monster when, of course, she is a monstered woman. And worse than that, she is a monstered rape survivor. Um, and a, a, an ignominious beginning to a long and continuing saga in which when women speak out about harm done to them, they are rendered by society, the outsider, the monster, the, the thing that has done things wrong. So I feel really strongly about her that she um, should be reconsidered as in context, as a sister, as a daughter, and as a protector. Because the truth of the matter is, if you have the ability to turn things to stone with a single glance and there are no named victims of you whatsoever, you must be trying really hard not to do that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm afraid like the big soft hearted person I am, it only makes me think that she is more lovable, more beautiful than before. Oh, I agree entirely. Yeah, I spend a lot of my time defending her as whenever <laughs> necessary. Yeah. Uh, but that that leads to another really interesting point, and I'm curious what you think about it. So one of the things 
that I kind of stand by and I recognize that it's not 100% explicit in the ancient texts. Um, but is this idea, because a lot of people will claim that it's Ovid who invented the rape survivor narrative. And I I would say that it is actually more present in Hesiod, um, not explicitly, but Im- implicitly due to the phrasing of how it happens, the words used, but also the fact that it's Poseidon. I think it's like, I mean, one, Hesiod doesn't really clarify in a lot of those cases, like whether something is consensual, because he's just not really concerned with it, um, which I think does not imply that it was understood to be consensual in the ancient world. Um, But also, like, Poseidon was almost never with somebody consensually, which I think you kind of write into his character pretty strongly. Um, Yeah, I do. Yeah. So, like, I mean, what do you think of, of, I guess, Poseidon, but also how... Do you consider it that Ovid invented this rape narrative or or that it's older? No, I don't. I don't think yeah. it would have even occurred to Ovid to think in those terms, particularly because I'm afraid, much as we might like it to be different, the phenomenon of consent is a relatively recent one. Mm. Um, and so I don't, uh, you know, you can see the ugly arguments that this view of other human beings leads to in historical texts just as much as mythological ones. I'm thinking, I guess, of the Melian dialogue in Thucydides where um, the the debate is between essentially, do we allow this city which has asked to become neutral to do that? Or do we go there, kill all the men and enslave all the women and children, which is the, the Athenian punishment and, and quite a, and used by other people too, not just the Athenians across a long period of history, um, for revolt or treachery or whatever. Um, and the Melians essentially say, don't do something as terrible as that because basically one day you'll be on the receiving end of someone with more power and don't you want to kind of set a precedent for being merciful mm. and the athenians offer a kind of might is right argument it's a uh presented to us essentially as a nomos versus fuzis debate um so the law versus natural law so the law is a road sign which says don't turn right um and you can obey that or not obey that but if turning right takes you straight over a cliff then gravity would be for this so give it a go see how it works out um and the athenians essentially argue for this they say it's in our nature as the stronger party to do whatever the hell we like and it's the nature of the weaker party to put up with it and although it's presented very in a very kind of brutal and chilly way by the athenians in this debate um i don't think it's a particularly unusual way of thinking um mm-hmm. in the ancient world indeed it probably isn't a very unusual way of thinking now i'm afraid Um, So I don't think there's any question of thinking in terms of consent, um, in terms of sex, really, um, with either very young women in the case of uh, Medusa or indeed very young men in the case of Ganymede. Mm -hmm. Um, Consent simply isn't, it just doesn't come up in our ancient sources. And until really recently, honestly, it wasn't coming up very much in classical scholarship either. You would get, I own books which sort of cheerfully defend the notion of being raped by a god because usually something good comes of it, by which they mean usually a demigod child. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, you get to live quite a long time if Hera doesn't turn you into a, and so on and so on and so on. Um, It's like, well, that, mm, I'm going to have to stop you there (laughs) and suggest that you think about this again. Um, So I... I think it's really important that we reassess these texts within the values of our time. But I think there's a huge and and important space between doing that and attributing our values to the past and assuming that characters created in the past could possibly have known what those values would be. People Mm -hmm. who don't argue against slavery in the ancient world would include, for example, Jesus. So even by our standards, we would think, but surely everyone can agree that slavery is wrong. But it simply didn't occur to aristotle to to feel that way about it and he was pretty smart um and you know so it, i think it's important that we we retain this distinction and the idea of consent of course when you live in a world with slavery and i, I always say when i talk about slavery in the ancient world because it's really important that we remember it there are more slaves in the world now than there were in the ancient world i do see mm. we have a larger population now but it is worth considering when you live in a world which has slavery and doesn't question slavery I think asking people to think about consent in any context Mm -hmm. is probably it's a step too far. You've already dehumanized huge chunks of the population. So, of course, you'll continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's very it's interesting. It's it it is fascinating the way 
I mean, fortunately things are changing now, but yeah, I mean, I have a, a book of mythology that's like 20 years old and the author who is obviously a man, the way he describes what happens to Medusa and Athena's reaction is like one of the most horrifying things I've ever read, just in terms of like the level of disdain he has and and also like it doesn't remotely he's clearly describing the ovid version which i think ovid is pretty clear that it's like a violent act yes Um, he says by force yeah yeah he's he's very like this is not you know something that she liked and and this author rewrites it as something that medusa did really intentionally and like that athena you know saw that i don't know it was really is interesting to me where i was like you made it worse than ovid like you added misogyny that's not even in the ancient texts and that's just... incredibly common i'm afraid yeah Again, the example i always give is the odyssey where telemachus hangs the slave mm-hmm. women who he and his father decide have been conspiring with the suitors although of course they are slaves so they don't mm-hmm. have consent there isn't there going to be no possibility of consent because that's what it means to be an enslaved person mm-hmm. um and when Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey came out, she accurately um, translated the line where he um, hangs them all from the same length of rope. She translates the word for these female slaves as the female slaves. Um, The word in Greek is the word for slave in the plural and feminine with the article in the plural and feminine to match the female slaves. And when I reviewed that um, excellent translation, I tracked down, I think, four or five different translations of the Odyssey from the 20th century, and I think one from the 21st. And every single one of them had translated it as harlots, um, hussies, slattens. I mean, it, it essentially had added in some misogyny to justify their hero Odysseus's behavior. It's like, mm-hmm. well, it's a sufficiently disturbing piece of behavior that inspired Margaret Atwood to write the Penelope ad. So, you know, I'm fine with us just acknowledging how horrible it is. And yet over and over again, you see that translators, I'm sure not from any kind of position of malice, just decided they should make it clear what Odysseus was really doing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, very well done for that. But we might call that editorializing. (laughs) So, you know, it's it's a little bit more honest, I think, if you do it in a novel than in a a translation. Um, And obviously, when I come to editorialize, for example, Perseus, or as you say, Poseidon, um, I think it's, you know, that it's in plain sight. It, it's right there. There's no point. I'm not pretending that this is a, a translation of a missing text found, you know, by me that mm-hmm. survives from the ancient world. I'm presenting you these myths, which I have been steeped in since I was 12 when I started studying Latin, 14 when I started studying ancient Greek. So I've spent my whole adult life and then some here. And it's like, but I am also alive now in the 21st century and steeped in the feminism of my mother and all our foremothers so yeah this is the text you're going to get from me Mm -hmm. Well, that, I mean, brings up some important characters that I'd love to talk about, too. I mean, broadly, I think I really enjoy your use of Poseidon and Zeus. So I'm curious, like, I I mean, they're just sort of the versions I think of them um, in terms of their behavior. But how did you want to go about handling any of the gods, I would say, and Perseus, too? Like, what was your sort of intention with with it was a lot of fun to do actually because I realized that I was thinking of those that vase painting the one you mentioned with the cabesis that's in the mm-hmm. British Museum is a case in point really but the one in the Met just as much where he's he's wearing winged sandals those have been borrowed from Hermes he's wearing a winged hat that's the cap of darkness that belongs to Hades it looks like it's uh, Hermes's hat but it is not at least according to our literary sources it's Hades's that he's wearing mm-hmm. so Shoes from Hermes, hat from Hades. The Cabesis is alone from the Hesperides. Um, it's a you know sacred item carrier, so it's gold and silver tassels, so it's much stronger than a regular bag. Um, the sword, the harpe, belongs to Zeus. Again, it's alone from the Hesperides. And on the um, Met vase, although he doesn't have the backpack on that version, he is looking behind him and consulting with Athene, who's behind him. So it's like, well, there are five different gods or sets of gods involved in this process of decapitation and there are two ways of looking at this and I think probably both of them are are true the first of course is to say 
this young man is incredibly favored by the gods because look at them all queue up to help him. You know, this is truly a son of Zeus because all these other gods are offering him assistance. But the other way of looking at it and equally valid is just how useless is this young man that so many gods have to help him? How much help does Heracles have when he's off on all his tasks? Almost none at all. If anything, he's got a hindrance because Hera is hurling further obstacles at him constantly. And whenever she gets the chance, even if it's the weather, she'll do it. So, yeah, you know, and yet he still manages to complete all these labors pretty well, not a, entirely, but pretty well single handedly. And, you know, job done. Thanks very much. Perseus needs all these deities to assist him. Well, that speaks to me of a man who is rather helpless. So the fun thing about writing him was trying not to make him helpless, because contrary to the response of some of my readers, I don't think he is helpless, actually. The problem is that we always see him in context, almost always see him in context with Athene. When we see him in the context of his mother, he doesn't seem anywhere near as helpless. Mm. Um, and, uh, and similarly with Andromeda, when she sees him, she doesn't see him as someone helpless at all. But most of the way through the book, we see him um, as he is in some kind of scene with Athene and with Hermes. And asking them to understand his motivation in anything is like asking you or me to understand what an ant thinks. These are gods that live on Mount Olympus. Their lives are so long, so unmeasurable, so uncuttable, that our lifespan is just like blinking to them. So what on earth would be the point in trying to understand how humans do anything? What would be the point? They'll be gone in a minute. You know, I've just literally just heard you say, I don't want to do it like, and then now you're dead. So what difference does it make? And so he and she don't understand each other at all. And the delight of writing those scenes, which I think are some of the funniest scenes in the book, um, was being able to have this total clash of understanding. He can't possibly hope to understand her. She's a deity. She can't be bothered to try and understand him. He's just a puny mortal. So this total culture clash was, I mean, it was just a lot of fun to write because it made me, once I'd realized that the the joy would be in trying to work out what he didn't know and, and when he would reveal this ignorance to gods who just assume everyone knows everything all the time, because why wouldn't you? It, it really it was they, those scenes were all fun to write mm -hmm. yeah I can I can definitely you you can tell you had fun writing those ones and and particularly like I think just Athena broadly because her character yeah, I did yeah I've got no fun. poker face at all at <laughs> all and you can hear every time I'm typing you can and on the audiobook you can hear it even worse I'm you know I know that people's response to Athena is going to be quite layered because sometimes she's really funny sometimes she is you know the perpetrator of absolute horror mm -hmm. and sometimes she's the recipient of horror and so I don't really like trying to delineate people into you know this person's a villain this person's a hero this person's a victim there's like an awful lot of people can be all of those things at different times in their life and sometimes more of than one of those things at the same time and so I I had an absolute ball writing her um which makes me feel a bit guilty really <laughs> um, but you know it is what it is huh I mean she she is so fascinating though because she is such a complex character and like and I think what you just how you just described all of that though the characters who can be so many different things that's so especially true for Greek mythology because and this is something I say so often on the show but like you know that these stories weren't developed in the way that that we develop stories now they didn't have the same intention the same background any of that and so like they weren't, I mean, other than the heroes, which even their version of what heroes were is different from what we would think of today. But other than even say them, like everyone is just serving their own purpose in each one of the stories. Like no one is inherently good all the time and no one is inherently bad all the time. Uh, I think about this a lot when, you know, so many pop culture reception, various things when it comes to Greek myth are always making Hades the villain. Absolutely it, right. Yeah. yeah, and it's like it's, he's, it's so he's never the villain in Greek myth. Yeah, like well, because he's been again, I'm afraid, tainted by Christian thinking that mm -hmm. you know the god who lives in the underworld must be the devil because it's the same thing as hell. And the fact that there are the Elysian fields as well, it's like it's everyone's underworld, mate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, unless you get actually deified and go hopping up to Mount Olympus, it's everyone's underworld. But we're determined to make him evil. So, and sometimes that really plays to. A strength so it is it works incredibly well i think in disney's hercules mm -hmm. because you know you've got james woods why wouldn't he be evil that's exactly what we've all turned up for um 
but other times yes i agree you're just like you understand that he's okay nothing never mind yes <laughs> doesn't matter we'll talk another time yeah <laughs> Yeah, and I think Athena is such a good character for that. And I think she appears that way really strongly in your book where you're like, she's fun, she's funny, she's really she's really dry in a way that like she's got quite a unique personality, but also she does horrible things because she's a Greek goddess and like there's horrible things that happen in mythology and it doesn't make the character bad. It just makes them a god or just part of a Greek myth. I mean, um, she's completely amoral and yeah. all, my, all my versions of Greek gods are amoral. And I don't think that's my invention i think it's, it goes back to at least the iliad you mm -hmm. know where mm. the homeric gods are completely amoral incredibly petty um when i used to teach this a very long time ago I would just say they're like super powered toddlers that's they have they don't want or not want anything with any grandeur at all it's entirely petty every single time and yet they want it with a profundity that you and i can only begin to dream of because we can only want something really, really intensely for a few months, weeks, years, whereas they can do it for millennia. So, you know, our, our feelings obviously are going to be more intense. And you get that, I think, with Perseus responding to Athena in particular, but Hermes as well, is that he, you know, the petulance in him, it comes from, I think, just a, an absolute sense that he's not being heard, that he's not understood. And of course, you know, he's a doted on child by his mother and his sort of honorary grandfather. And so he's used to being heard and the the terrible pain of going from that to being just absolutely ignored. Um, I think it, it comes across in him as, as petulance, but it, it's a quite a profound psychological <laughs> scar. So yes, but as the, as the book progresses, I think he, in some ways he becomes more like Athene in ways that I don't think she would have ever noticed and I didn't intend when I was writing it but I mm. realized once I'd finished it when I did the audiobook recording I was like oh, oh yeah so, yeah sometimes these things happen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well one of the things that was sort of surprised me reading it and I it plays into what you mentioned about how you attempted or thought for a moment of doing a book that was just in one point of view and then decided to go with Never so many me. more no fair enough so you fit in so many different points from mythology, like far more than I was expecting. Like Gigantomachy comes to mind as the most obvious. Oh man, that was fun to do. Yeah, that I was bet all so. based on the <laughs> Pergamon altar in Berlin. Yeah, and um, so at the risk of destroying the magic, um, then I was writing that chapter in January, I think, of 2021, and I had begun it, and I wanted to write it closely based on the Pergamon altar with some necessary changes, um, which I won't today discuss because I don't want to spoil the end of the book. <laughs> um, and it's a long time since I'd been in Berlin and we couldn't travel. You know, Britain was in lockdown. Mm -hmm. Germany was in lockdown. The museums were shut anyway. And Britain had just, in its many spasms of leaving the EU, um, had finally done that. And so, the, you know, there was just these huge problems with um, trying to transport goods in and out of Europe to the UK because we'd suddenly added like 10 million pieces of paperwork to it. And I was like, well, I really wish I could see these pictures up close. But I, you know, the pictures that I took, it's so long since I was last there, they were on a film camera, you know, they're probably at my mom's house. That's no good. I don't want her to go to the post office. You know, she's not as young as she was. Sorry, mom. Um, and so I was like, I really, need, and there were no detailed close-up pictures online that I could find. Mm. And I found this incredible looking book that I really, really wanted. And it looked like it had really good close-up photographs in it. And I thought, well, I'll order it from the museum. And by the time it turns up, I'll probably have finished the scene, but I can go back and, and make changes later and that will be okay. Um, and so I ordered it from a closed museum in a locked down country to be sent across a newly erected trade border where things were being, you know, delayed for weeks at a time to another lockdown country. And it was here 48 hours later. Oh, my God. <laughs> this, is, this has gone surprisingly well, everybody. So <laughs> yeah. I just sat here like, oh, my God, thank you. And so the, I, the, the details of that that sequence, the Gigantomachy, are all taken pretty well, all taken from the Pergamon altar. I had to um track down a place in Flegra where it is which is one of the locations given for the Gigantomachy so I mm -hmm. found a place with pictures online because obviously I couldn't travel to Greece either um that that looked like it would be a good scene for a gods versus giants battle and uh and so it all came from there 
Oh, that's wonderful. So did you always want to like cover as many myths as you could sort of fit into the narrative or did that come up as you were writing? I wanted to cover as much of Medusa's story as I could and I knew the right way to do that very quickly. Um, Wasn't just to focus on her and her sisters but was to expand the narrative accordingly and of course I'd done that with ships which seemed like a more you know plausible version of that because you knew straight away you'd have the Greeks the Trojans and the gods if you wanted them Mm -hmm. um but with Medusa it's like well what happens if we take this story and it's all focused on this single person and very quickly it became clear that Athene would be a sort of antagonist um or a dual protagonist I suppose if you prefer and that then the story of how her character develops would become in some ways as important as how Medusa's develops and so there were just so many voices to include, but it, the the majority of the extra voices come from Athena's life story rather than mm-hmm. just from Medusa's. But if somebody is your nemesis, to use it in its modern rather than its Greek goddess term, we need to know why. You know, it's not good enough to just say, as a you know ancient Greek man writer would have said and indeed did say, oh, and then Athena was angry with her, and so this. Um, it's like, well, that's that's not going to cut it. Here, this is a novel now it's not just a poem I can't just dazzle you with my beautiful metrical arrangements and then move on to something else Ovid style um you know this this requires actual cause and effect so mm-hmm. I wanted to show you both of them in the round and as many of the characters as I could really in the round and even you know Perseus who who is not a particularly sympathetically drawn character um I think he still deserved his context you know he's Danai needed to be brought into the story from my perspective anyway, to explain Perseus, because really his his redeeming feature is that he cares about his mother. Mm-hmm. And that's not the, the worst thing anyone's ever done. So I didn't want to miss out any of those parts of the story. And then generally, just when I was thinking, um, you know, is this too much? Are there going to be too many people? Um, then something like a, a chatterbox crow would turn up and I'd be like, oh, everyone's going to let me have this one. No one's going to make me cut this one out. This is going to be too much fun. So yeah, they all sort of, they they, they all felt necessary as I went along um, mm-hmm. to illuminate the story sort of as as fully and as roundly as I could. Well, and once you'd have that many, like it, it seems like you it's sort of, you might as well add more, especially when they come up naturally. Like I really enjoyed the snakes, you know, suddenly we're getting yeah. individual snakes perspective in her hair. Um, I was curious cause you used so much Greek in there. Um, whether like even your publisher or anyone else was worried that people weren't, they or weren't. it was going to take too long to figure out they were the snakes. Yeah, no, they weren't. I mean, there's in the UK version, um, there's a snake that goes down the page, a drawing of a snake on the mm. page. And I guess I don't know if that will be in the American version because I haven't seen a finished copy yet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so not we'll in the see. arc, I can tell you. It's, yeah, but that's yeah. the advance, so it probably wouldn't be. But. Yeah, I, so I don't know. Um, mm. But it does, There is. It, they are mentioned in the list of characters at the front, which I think right. will have survived the journey. But again, I haven't seen a finished copy, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, it's always a risk. It's always a risk that people won't guess something. But I would much rather be baffled than bored as a reader and oh, as yeah. a viewer. So I think by that point, people will probably trust me. Um, but, you know, we'll see. The crow has the good grace to announce itself. Of course. <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm a crow, basically. Um, and the snooty olive trees similarly uh, get, they sort of reveal their characters quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just irresistible to me to keep you know, I thought I thought I would spend more time. I thought I would spend more time with the Andromeda storyline. I think than I did because mm. such big things happened to her. But they're so big; they sort of defy too many pages. It's like it would throw the novel off off center. So, her story is told in the third to give it again that slight distance because, you know, she's a smart cookie. I think Andromeda. She's she's she makes a good play through the book, and I I felt like it deserved. She deserved the chance to you know make choices that improved her prospects as far as she was concerned I mean obviously my opinion of her choices is uh, that she'd be better off adjourning to a nunnery uh, but you know mm-hmm. anachronistically but uh, fair I think so yes I guess she could have gone off and become a, a servant of Artemis or something yeah that might have been a little bit better but you know I, for me yes but <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell her how to live I've done no. enough of that by, yeah. by writing a novel <laughs> so yeah she's allowed to do whatever she likes after the end of the pages yeah no and I'm 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 curious to see the the finished copy in North America um 
and obviously we'll be buying one the the use of i mean there was just so much in there as somebody who who obviously like knows all the myths like the back of my hand it was so interesting to see so many different ones including you know the the Hephaestus and Athena bit with the the birth of Erichthonius and just the the way you kind of incorporated so much of her story to explain to explain Athena like as a character was was very interesting and unexpected um how did you it was I mean the hardest thing to do yeah. actually and the whole technically it was the hardest thing to do was to impose a timeline on a god oh um, yeah god. And it hadn't really <laughs> occurred to me just how necessary it would be mm-hmm. and therefore how difficult it would become but in the end I couldn't write I couldn't write the first of the Athene chapters until I, I because there are all these stories about her that appear in all these different sources never all together in the same place often within the same poem or even the same visual artwork they are self-contradictory you know, she is holding or wearing a thing that she will acquire as a result of the thing that she's currently doing. And it's like, oh, I have a question. No, never mind. Doesn't matter. Um, and so she was extremely difficult at first mm-hmm. to work out. And then in the end, I basically just made a huge list of, you know, cool stories that Athene is in, um, things that she does, things that are done to her, things that she is interested in and so on. Um, that were from the grandeur and scale of the Gigantomachy to this tiny little reference um, that she is the the goddess who invents the flute. Um, Mm. And I went through this huge long list of stuff. And then basically I picked the stories that I thought were most important, most integral to the Medusa story, some of which were easy because they contained them both, and some of which were more difficult because I felt they would illuminate it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And then I imposed an order and said, it goes this way. Um, and at that point, it it all suddenly became much more manageable mm-hmm. because, you know, obviously some of her scenes are with Perseus. So his timeline dictates those, but they can't contradict hers. And it, it is virtually impossible to find an ancient artwork where any kind of coherence is, is even attempted on the subject of the gods and and what they do because of course you know it's the perfect illustration these stories bubble up across two thousand years and across many many thousands of miles um and so of course they are contradictory um so yeah imposing any kind of order on athene felt like a, a slightly blasphemous goal but it was worth it i think yeah it's always my first recommendation to people when they're trying to understand greek myth is like don't try to figure out a timeline it's yeah, only going it's... to hurt you and it's going to be more confusing than is necessary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it's really satisfying. Like the people who spend all their time looking at the timelines of the Odyssey where, mm-hmm. you know, obviously mm-hmm. there are flashbacks within flashbacks. It's fantastically complicated um, and really good fun. But man, you are onto an absolute loser if you try to do that. You know, there's there's a moment in the Odyssey where Circe says to Odysseus, oh, you know, don't go through those wandering rocks, I think, because Jason went that way and he only got through because Hera helped him. And you're like, OK, great. So now I know the Argonautica. Is before. And so sometimes when there are human beings involved, you can impose an order, but it, it, it will always betray you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you will always find yourself suddenly painted into a corner going, no, hang on a minute. <laughs> Well, I, I think about that a lot, too, with Athena and Hephaestus, because there is also narratives around Hephaestus being born of Hera because she was mad that Zeus had Athena. But then Hephaestus helps Zeus birth Athena. And you're like, well, what are we yes. supposed to do with this? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank yeah. goodness they're immortal, because otherwise this would be incredibly confusing. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. But yeah, I mean, you're right. Of course, these things are completely circular. It's the Ourobulus, isn't it? It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a snake eating its own tail. And you do just have to impose an order. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm reasonably careful to not let the gods get ever involved in the idea of time. You know, occasionally it'll be like, oh, this is quite pressing. Why? That kid that is technically yours is about to drown. Um, but they, they can either do really imminent or forever. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and other than that, I don't really allow them to get too tangled up in time. In a way, it was it was a much more central theme of the book than I expected it to be, because I thought the theme of the book when I read that. Um, chunk in Hesiod I thought the theme of the book would be mortal versus immortal um, mm. you know Medusa is mortal her sisters are immortal how will that be for them and almost immediately it became clear that the thing that would be important in their relationship wouldn't be 
they know that she can die and she knows that they can't, but would be she experiences change and they don't. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's a necessary corollary of immortality, I think, that you're unchanging. And the, the Gorgons are a lot less lofty than the Olympians, literally and metaphorically. They live uh, on Earth. Um, they are creatures of the sea, the sky and, and the land where they live, but their parents are sea gods and they have wings. Um, so they're completely liminal creatures. And they are still, Uriali and Steno are still obviously um, immortal and unchanging in a way. But then the attention of the book came with, well, what happens if you give those goddesses a mortal creature to care for? Mm -hmm. And the answer is they learn to change because that's what love means. Um, And so... They they gradually and you know neither of them wants it and yet it happens to them just the same. They they learn exactly what love means even though they didn't particularly intend to, because they realise they're frightened for her when she gets hurt, um, and that's what it means to to be mortal. Mm-hmm. Um, And so it, it turned out to be much, much more about the passage of time than I realized. But perhaps that's just because I'm getting so old. I can't quite tell. <laughs> I mean, also writing it in a pandemic means that time has become like a mm. a baffling thing to navigate. Like Yeah, you know. like an accordion, right? Where sometimes it's really, really long between mm-hmm. two points. And then sometimes they're right next to each other. You're like, dude, stop doing that. Yeah. Start. No one even wants to hear the accordion. Now stop it. But <laughs> yeah, that's how it feels. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that brings up another thing that I that I find so interesting about Medusa and was really satisfied by how you handled it. But the idea of her being this mortal uh, with an immortal family has always I mean, it is just inherently fascinating. And I've always kind of wondered whether there was any thought process behind it in the ancient Greek world, like whether they tried to ever navigate why that would be, because it feels to me like either there's this big reason that we don't know or it's just explicitly to allow Perseus to kill her but that also feels too simple and so I mean how did you approach like explaining why she would be this like singular mortal character um I don't think I did really I basically (laughs) treat her as though she is a mutant Um, yeah that's essentially the mindset that I had. Mm. It's like, well, what would happen if you had a sibling who was just somehow weirdly different from you? Right. And at the moment, I can literally hear the, the you can metaphorically hear the voice of my big brother sniggering right now um, and saying, yeah, we've all had to live through that. Um, but what do you do when that, um, when that, when that happens, when that sibling mm. comes along? And I think a lot of the time we're so bamboozled by the people we're closest to. They're so utterly other than us even as we grow up in the same world and my brother has a fantastically good memory for our childhood I can remember almost nothing so when I need to know about what it was like when we were kids I have to ask him um and then when he says it, I'm like oh yeah of course that's right but I haven't remembered it on my own so you know we have this completely different way of of approaching even our own kind of communal memory quite aside from anything more, more external than that so I think perhaps it is just the case that everybody ends up feeling that way about the people they're closest to, that they also could not be further away. You know, those boundaries uh, between us exist, even though there are times with the people we love when they just dissolve. And it's like, we're inside each other's hearts and we're inside each other's minds. We know, I know everything that you're thinking right now. You know, my brother and I can't play charades with other people because we win so fast, it's just embarrassing. And yet, um, you know, we we have this completely different outlook on life. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I wish I could explain it to you in a sort of mythos sense why why there would be this distinction drawn. My guess is that it's uh, it doesn't come up at all until relatively late, which is you know when Perseus comes into the story that originally and archaeologically we can see Gorgonea, these Gorgon heads, all over the place in mm-hmm. the ancient Greek world, and that's not particularly unusual because heads and sort of grotesque heads, particularly um, somewhere between a mask and a face, um, 
they're drawn by everybody you know all cultures have these kinds of masks or or extreme faces as as far as i can tell um and you know even if you give a kid a, a piece of paper and a yellow pen they'll draw the sun and it will have a, a smiley face and it will have you know those sort of um emanating rays like a lion's mane exactly like a gorgon would look if you ask them to draw one of those i suspect mm -hmm. and so i think most probably what what happens is that we get these gorgonea these protective heads they're apotropaic i think from their locations they're not just designed to be scary they're also de designed to protect mm -hmm. um much like the evil eye is used now in jewelry or you know key rings or whatever in greece or in turkey and then the bodies come come secondarily we get gorgons a little bit later than we get these original often as i say quite monstrous heads the heads i think are designed as a sort of emblem or talisman against the fears of the natural world the very wide mouth with the lolling tongue represents the noise of thunder perhaps um the mass of snakes looks like you know snakes but also like a lion's mane the tusks obviously reminiscent of wild boar so lots of things that can kill you in ancient mm -hmm. Greece so I think the heads exist as a sort of reflection of contemporary fears or a manifestation of contemporary fears in order to make them a bit more manageable mm -hmm. um and then they're followed by bodies, which have to be a bit monstrous because look at the faces, so they get wings. And then I think probably, and I can't prove it, but I believe it, that, you know, people said, well, how come we've got all these heads separated from these bodies? We must need somebody with a sword. Mm. Um, and that's Perseus's role in the story. So, but then by the time we have a long form narrative version of it, which is Ovid, you know, this story has been going around for hundreds of years by then. And so, you know, there's mention of the Gorgon head in the Iliad and one in the Odyssey. Um, mm. So it's already hundreds of years old. And then at that point, it's like, oh, well, you know, now we need this hero to have a monster to overcome. Like, well, that's not the way I see it, I'm afraid. I see it as us needing a man with a sword to separate a head from a body. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it, it's just, it's generally so interesting to compare the the Gorgonea, those, those images of just the heads with, with then Hesiod's version or take on it where he explicitly says that one was mortal. And then to get to the pottery that we talked about at the beginning where, you know, other than the wings, she's so inherently human. Um, and well, I also because think... she goes through the same beautification process in the fifth century that mm -hmm. art in the Greek world generally does. So if you see earlier pieces of mm -hmm. her, she looks much stranger and more extreme or grotesque. Mm -hmm. She gets prettified in the fifth century, like everybody gets prettified mm -hmm. in the fifth century, which in a way is great because you get beautiful art. And in a way, of course, it's horrible because it betrays a mindset which says that people are good on the outside if they're good on the inside and vice versa. Um but I mean, of course, that does in turn reveal that Medusa is presumably meant to be a beautiful human being when mm -hmm. we see her painted on a vase looking like a beautiful young girl, because mm -hmm. we know for sure this is happening at a time when beauty is seen as being an, an external beauty is seen as a reflection of your internal good character. You know, you can see that in oh, which Plato dialogue is it? The Hippias Major, I think, when they talk mm -hmm. about beauty. Um, and uh, gloriously, he says at one point, beauty is difficult. <laughs> it is difficult. Yeah, really good point. Um, so, yeah, but the, if you look at some of the, there is a beautiful, beautiful Gorgon at the Archaeological Museum in Corfu, which I think is 6th mm. century BCE, and it's huge. It's the pediment from the Temple of Artemis, so it's about 13 metres across. I can't do that in yards. Um, oh I'm so sorry, America. But it's vast, and I knew this because I'd written about it in Pandora's Jar, and yet still, when I walked around a corner and saw it, I, I, I didn't even gasp. I laughed out loud. She's yeah. massive. And this version of her, she's so oh strong. God. She's got muscly arms. They're cycling. Her legs are cycling. She's got, you can't see much of the wings because it's, I think it's sandstone um, that it's mm. made of and it hasn't survived beautifully. But you can see a few feathers lurking behind her. So her arms are pumping. She's probably flying rather than running, but the muscles in her legs are absolutely incredible. Mm. And the thing I love about her most is that actually, she's got this amazing belt made of winding snakes, which is just beyond cool. But additionally, on top of all of this, so she's properly, she looks like a deity. She looks super other. She could not look stranger or more like she's undergoing her epiphany, which I think is probably what we're supposed to think. And she's got these beautiful round cheeks, little chubby mm. cheeks. And just like in Pindar, when he calls her Yuparu, you know, she's got beautiful cheeks, beautiful cheeks. Medusa. You're like, she does have beautiful cheeks. And because I'm really lucky and I don't only view beauty through the prism of people I would like to have sex with at some point, I can see that this monstrous god is beautiful and mm -hmm. it's not difficult to see at all mm -hmm. uh, well i always think of um those i think they're sixth century uh the b ocean pottery 
where right, it's with the horses yeah the horse bodies uh no the there's ones where it's her sister is like um protecting her and medusa's head is already off and there's like a tiny pegasus coming off of her neck oh sure yeah yeah they're like very black figure and and very unique looking and i just love that one because the 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 sisters are so clearly protecting her it's too yeah. late but they're like you can see the fury directed at perseus and he's like running away like a little coward and they're just they're such beautiful pieces but the the way they visualize the gorgons is this it's almost like a combination of that beauty and you know quote unquote monstrosity by that i just mean yeah. not human um because their the bodies are pretty human but their heads like the snakes it's as if they sure. have like three big snake hair <laughs> yeah yeah i tend to go with extreme as the word to describe them and mm, sometimes grotesque mm-hmm. but but the same the same things are present in this um in this pediment in mm. in corfu because she is still alive or, mm-hmm. or perhaps immortal you know it, it it does look like an epiphanic image from art that we see in the ancient near east so perhaps at this point she's become a goddess but she for sure still has her head because it's attached to her body mm-hmm. and yet on either side of her she is flanked by her own offspring by pegasus mm. and chrysale who are traditionally um, born from her severed neck as the children of poseidon mm-hmm. something which i excluded from my telling of it because i thought it was probably a step too far into weirdness for a, a non very nerdy audience um which is you know don't get me wrong i'm here for the nerds all day long but i felt like i i didn't want to make things just unreasonably difficult um yeah but yeah i mean she is she is shown therefore in this extraordinary setting as being supremely powerful Mm -hmm. as i say she seems to have transcended mortality at this point and have become a goddess um the belt i'm told by the very brilliant theologian francesca stavrakopoulou professor francesca stavrakopoulou um the snake belt is a symbol of great power of a god or goddess in Mm -hmm. um the ancient near east which is her specialist area um and so and there we see her with her with her offspring that's really her. lovely it's an extraordinary piece and then yeah. also she has a, a leo panther you know those lovely somewhere between a leopard and a panther yeah. or a lion and a panther um cats on either side of her and they've got the most oh. beautiful swirly fur i cannot recommend oh. it enough oh my cannot god now, I, now i have to go to corfu <laughs> you honestly do i'm so sorry for your loss oh yeah it'll be so difficult <laughs> another burden to, to carry oh, greece it's so difficult to travel there i never want to yeah it's that's i love that because I love this. I mean, I don't I don't want to say I love the story of Pegasus, but I love that Pegasus is her child. It's unfortunate, you know, the the only way that he gets born is once her head is gone. So it is so nice to have a version where she is where they're alive. contemporaneous. Yes, yeah. like where she actually knows that she has children at all. Yeah. And it, it was interesting to me that you left that part out. And I do think you're right. Like, I, I couldn't imagine weaving it into that part of the story because it ends up like it's not comedic, but it's difficult to not present. It's it. really hard to do it any other yeah. way. Uh, it is it is really interesting that there are there are moments which you don't notice until you come to write them where you're like, oh, yeah, this can't possibly work no. outside of the context of ancient poetry because it's just too weird. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes you don't, you, sometimes as a classicist, you sort of forget because none of it seems weird. You've been talking about it for so long. And then or you're all like, of no. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you're like, oh, no, hang on. <laughs> yeah, sorry, this is actually quite weird. Um, yeah. And, you know, sometimes it takes another person to notice it because you don't. But that time I knew immediately that it would. I'd written about that part of her life as a, a mother albeit a, an imminently deceased mother in Pandora's jar and I knew it wasn't going to fit into Stone Blind but it goes that way sometimes you know I really wanted to write about Hermione in A Thousand Ships mm. as Helen's daughter there's a, an unbelievably beautiful and tragic Ovid poem about her and it mm. just did not fit it just took the focus too far forwards in time and then it meant wrenching it back instead of taking you back you know that that narrative is supposed to sort of lap over you like waves and I, I just couldn't make it work I had to jettison mm-hmm. it these things happen yeah yeah well and i mean yeah with with pegasus i think i i do also think you kind of left it almost if i recall incorrectly but like it's almost like it could have happened we just don't know about it like it's not like it was sort exactly. of explicitly yes. not it's not yeah. ruled out for you yeah, yeah. no it's so. generally with my writing it's full of um easter eggs for big myth nerds or classics oh, yeah. nerds I'm... or both 
I think I um, found them all. <laughs> yeah, I would say you should probably get a special egg to to register this, I think. Um, but yeah, I don't very often, I'm much more likely to make a little oblique hat tip to something than I am to cut it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, no, no question. This is the book I've read that has the most mythology inside it or most that I'm like, I, I think it also proved to me just how long I've now been doing this and how much I'm steeped in myth. Cause I was like, Oh, there, there's not a thing in this that I did not know happened in a really satisfying way where I was like, I think I'm I delighted. might know mythology fairly well. <laughs> like, yeah. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was proving to myself quite a bit. Um, well, I mean, God, Medusa is just, I could definitely talk about her forever. And I'm just trying to think of, is there, are there any other characters that you really were thrilled that you were able to include or really enjoyed writing about oh I enjoyed doing almost all of them even the monstrous bits I quite enjoyed um so you know there were moments where I thought this isn't necessarily going to be other people's favorite kind of character in this book but they very quickly occupied space I mean Danai is such a again such a forgotten character Mm -hmm. in Greek myth we sort of you know she's sort of the punchline really to and sometimes Zeus manages to impregnate someone like this. And you're like, well, yeah. but imagine if that was a person. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, and so, you know, she's so sort of sweet and long suffering. And so she is a very, there's a very kind of passive element to her, which I felt like the the narrative kind of required. Um, mm. But it does, it does mean we have these sort of two versions of motherhood of Danae to Perseus and then Cassiope to Andromeda, mm-hmm. and these two versions, there are all, all almost all the way through the book, there are um, relationships stalking other versions of themselves mm. through the book. There are um, good and bad brothers, there are good and bad mothers, um, or different types of mother at the very least, mm-hmm. um, from the absent to the really present, to the you know unable to age, to the um, unable to accept. Um, and so those kinds of things were quite interesting. But I didn't think I'd really written about sisters in any great depth until this book. And so actually just writing the three Gorgons, writing Steno and Uriali as well, was just a delight because it's a really particular kind of love I think siblings have for one another, even if, you know, they are older um, or more immortal um, and she is younger or more fragile, then it mm-hmm. still isn't a maternal relationship. You know, they have a, a different response to her. Um and I really loved doing it. And there were other, you know, stories like the Gryai, you know, the three grey ladies, the spirits of the sea, um, who disgustingly to our minds uh, share a single eye and a single tooth and take it in turns to insert one or both of these into their faces. You know, that was the first really kind of laugh out loud, loud slash squeam, squeamishly <laughs> cry um chapter in the entire and it was like oh yeah no this is this is gonna be a this is gonna be a ball but honestly I really loved writing the Hesperides um mm. even though just deciding on the numbers was you know <laughs> like, oh my god could one source agree with one other source never um but I realized I had seen so many times variations on a scene of a man comes into a grove and there are naked ladies present um, or some men come into a grove and there is a naked lady present. And, you know, there are some really beautiful artworks that describes um, some incredible Renaissance art. And, and there are some incredible artworks that that notice that that's actually a bit creepy. I am thinking of Artemisia Gentileschi and um, uh, the creepy old men watching. Is it Susanna? I think they're watching bathing. Mm. Um, but the delight of taking that scene and and switching it and saying, well, what would happen if there's a beautiful naked young man? and a bunch of pervy girls <laughs> just yep. turn up and start laughing at him steal and his clothes I, do the whole thing yeah yeah <laughs> I mean they are basically mean girls um and and why wouldn't they be you know that's the yeah. that's the sort of perk of being them I suppose um so yeah there were scenes like that which were so much in dialogue with not just ancient myth but more recent uh, only a could refer to the renaissance as recent but you know what I mean more recent reception of those myths and to be able to say all right extremely you know sexist male artists of 500 years ago what does it look like if a boy is in this position it was just I had a ball doing it Mm -hmm. no I can imagine and I to go back to the gray I I I think I love them too much and am too sympathetic to them because I 
it's funny I didn't remotely feel any kind of squeamishness I was just immediately like upset with Perseus and I think you handled yeah. that so well but also it made me so angry the way he <laughs> handled it and I was just like Good. I feel like yeah I mean I, yeah, I definitely know that was the point and it worked but I just I love them so much they're so unique it's one of my favorite things about Disney's Hercules that they conflate them with the fates in a way yes. that you get both of them in there it's it's my favorite but they are just so unique and I absolutely love that their their entire role in terms of surviving sources is just to do this one thing and yet yeah. they have this fascinatingly wonderful single eye and single tooth um they're just so weird in the in such they a are unique so weird. way and you think <laughs> yeah. they would have got loads of narrative but again not this is what kept happening to me through this book I was like okay so there's not that much on the Gorgons but there's going to be loads on Danai okay so there's not that much on the Gorgons <laughs> or Danai but there's going to be loads about Andromeda okay well <laughs> yeah but the gray eye right okay well but the Hesperides okay so yeah this is me the entire way through like right I, I suppose I better write it then so yeah. it was kind of joyous because you know the the narrative sections on Athene are a bit more detailed but even those are often quite glancing you know no one spends very long in ancient sources talking about motivation or things like that that you need as a novelist so it was an incredible journey of discovery of finding these just glorious bits of myth which sometimes I sort of felt like we really knew um but it's like, well, you're right. We know the Gryai from what? From Clash of the Titans, where they have a fantastic scene with Harry Hamlin. Um, and from Disney Hercules. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure they had a, a huge role otherwise in, in my cultural life. And the reason is because there's almost no material on them. It's mm -hmm. like, well, then, then I get to do this. I get to give them a voice. And that's going to be really good fun. So, yeah, they are very squabbly. Um, and I felt really conscious doing the audiobook of that, that I didn't have, you know, I couldn't give them each a different voice. It's like, well, they all lived in the same place. They kind of have different accents, but man, they were funny to do. I, they're just so fun. Like I, yeah, they're really some of my favorites because they're just so unique in this great way. So yeah, big fan of the gray. I was, I was very, uh, that was one of my favorite scenes, certainly, even if it ended horribly because Percy. <laughs> it's my way. I don't know. what you want <sighs> No, I mean, you, you did it well. I'm like, just. Perseus uh, <laughs> he gets paid back in the next bit yeah yeah it's, I mean you know he's got some issues yeah. it's fine yeah he doesn't he have it easy issues. at least yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no but and I, I did really appreciate too the the relationship you gave Danae and her father because I think a lot of the times and I can't even think if it's in sourcing or just like sort of the way we've interpreted it but it seems that he's often depicted as like evil for locking her away. Yeah. And I think there's like a bit of added complexity there um, in, in your version that was nice to have versus a sort of like inherently evil means of locking her up. Not that it wasn't yeah, evil. I but, mean, you just know. evil isn't interesting to write. So yeah. evil because scared or mm -hmm. evil because old age is frightening or evil because not having old age is more frightening <laughs> is, is just more fun to write. And the same with, mm -hmm. you know, Poseidon, who's, um, horrible self-regard is sort of pinned this incredible vanity is pinned to this incredible insecurity um when I when I write him because it's like well I don't think it necessarily makes him more sympathetic but I do think it makes him easier to understand mm -hmm. uh, and when it's a novel that's something which is important you don't want just random agents of chaos wandering across the scene and being chaotic because it would just be irritating after mm -hmm. a while so in quite a short while I think so it's like well why but why but why and that's so yeah structuring this book is like dealing with my niece <laughs> she's like but why does that happen yeah hang on a minute <laughs> I'll tell you something okay, up. okay this yeah <laughs> <But> why <laughs> one more second <laughs> yeah that just reminds me too of the inclusion of Amphitrite was wonderful because I feel like she's so often left out of almost everything that features Poseidon. oh yeah she nice was to have her yeah she was lovely to be able to do because uh, yeah he is so their relationship is is quite opaque mm -hmm. um and so I felt like she would be well you know exactly how she'll be uh, mm -hmm. but she would be both uh very quiet and at the same time deliberately opaque because that's the only way to survive yeah I mean if you're married to Poseidon yeah got a lot to deal with yeah yeah uh well I mean uh, I usually ask if there's anything you know else that you want to share with my listeners or anything but I, I also think we've covered a lot uh we have yeah well, you know if you come up with any more questions <laughs> I know we'll come back we'll do the we'll do the footnotes in a couple of weeks time 
<laughs> there's just there's always so much like I, I know I could talk about Medusa forever but I will not uh force that upon anyone else I do it enough on the I mean I've been talking her for four months on tour so far because yeah. the book came out in the UK and um September of, of 22 so yeah I, I've been doing a, I've talked about it for very many hours and it hasn't worn off yet so no yeah. she's so fascinating for somebody who has almost no sources actually associated with her uh oh but I you know what I will I will finish this off by telling you so I, I've sort of made it my case to to like defend Medusa on the internet whenever she comes up there was a time a couple years ago where she was like trending on Twitter really often for really weird reasons and I was like well I'm going to wade into this because I love her and I you know know all of her sources but I I've heard some of the wildest things from men on Twitter when you're defending Medusa because of all this misogyny that that we talked about you know that's been sort of placed upon her um but there were there were a couple of quote choice choice quotes that really stood out to me with the way that men have taken to seeing her and I think a lot because of everything that surrounded her for the past couple hundred years but one man told me that that actually Perseus uh, his killing of Medusa was a necessary uh, step because her death alleviated like a pressure on the earth like she was so evil that the earth wow. was like required her death um, and another said that that she also needed death because she was terrorizing the lands uh -huh. and like yeah. presented that as if that was a detail and I, it was so fascinating because I was like neither of those things are remotely included in any of the ancient sources like that's entirely yeah. invented it's yeah what can you do i mean you know yeah. if, if people are determined to find a, a monster then they'll find one i mm -hmm. think generally my favorite is um when freud was mm -hmm. engaging with the narrative and his his view was that her decapitation was uh, a metaphor for castration and it's like dude I don't know if you've noticed, she's technically female. <laughs> it's, it may not actually all be about your penis. Professor. And yet it's Freud. So, <laughs> yeah, so you know, but it's like generally when you get this sort of mass of hair um, or snakes or anything like that, a labyrinth, anything where there's a sort of chaos of, mm -hmm. um, of without a clear route through, it's generally taken to represent women's pubic hair mm. rather than men's. And yet, the, you know, it's just sitting there going, well, this must all be about me. Must It's like, dude. I think if you check, you'll find she is the absolute metaphor for male fear of the female gaze. Yeah. Um, you know, it's that it's literally being seen clearly by a woman you don't want to have sex with is the same as being turned to stone. It's completely disempowering. That's the only way, really, to read it. But well done on making it all about your genitalia. <laughs> like, thank you for being so on brand. <laughs> Well, you know what? That's that's exactly the perfect way to end this, I think. And I, I what think if, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a perfect phrasing on on what Medusa, you know, kind of actually represents. So I love that. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been so much fun to talk to you and about Medusa so specifically. I really appreciate it's it. It's always my pleasure. I love joining you. <sighs> oh, I'm so glad. It's yeah, such a thrill. Ugh, nerds, nerds, nerds. That conversation was so much fun. Like, gee, do you think I could talk about Medusa for the rest of my life and remain perfectly happy and content? Yeah, me too. <laughs> this novel was so good, featured so much mythology beyond Medusa and gods. It's just great. It's great. Highly recommend. There are even very Greek snakes. Polyphidia. You can follow Natalie on the usual socials media and find her books in many regions. Remember, she's also written The Children of Jocasta about, well, The Children of Jocasta and A Thousand Ships about the women of the Trojan War. Oh, that one's so good. And Pandora's Jar. Oh, man, that one's amazing. It's not a novel, but it's fucking fascinating. Oh, whew. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Th Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to cre creating promotional images and videos to editing and research. The podcast is hosted and monetized by I Heart Medusa. <laughs> I, uh, I, wrote, uh, I wrote this too quickly, and I wrote Medusa instead of media. Uh, it is I Heart Media. <laughs> Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you'll get bonus episodes and more. 
visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Thank you all for listening. Gods, these are fun to record. I am Liv and I love this shit. Thank you.